Hello and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We are excited that you could join us for another hour of good gardening. As you may know, we won't be taking your phone calls for the time being, but we are still accepting those emails and those pictures for future shows. That address is byf at unl.edu. And since most of you are at home during this time, you can also check out all those past shows and features on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So let's take a moment to do a little show and tell with samples that were brought in tonight. This is Kyle's debut, and he has a teensy sample, but not nearly as te teensy as Bill's Two Blades of Grass. So Kyle, what'd you bring? Yeah, so today I have um, some lace bugs or tingids. And these are, are some true bugs, very, very small here, and they get the name uh, lace bug from, from the appearance. They have kind of this, um, this, this lacy texture, um, fairly ornate. Um, these, these particular lace bugs, these are oak lace bugs, and uh, the adults here that I, I have, they overwinter uh, within the bark of a tree, um, in this case likely, likely, likely oak. And um, once it starts warming up, the, the leaves start expanding, coming out on the oaks. These are gonna, gonna migrate their way to the leaves and they have these piercing sucking mouth parts where they begin probing kind of like a syringe into the, into the leaf. Um, these adults will start mating pretty quickly and within a couple weeks you'll have eggs and, uh, and some immatures developing. And uh, as the summer progresses, and we, as we get to midsummer, uh, you might start seeing damage from these, uh, these lace bugs showing up. And this will look like kind of a, a whitish or yellow uh, spotting on, on the leaves. Um, generally speaking, for a healthy, mature plant, the, the plants can tolerate their feeding pretty well. They don't, they don't cause too much harm to the plant, uh, to the tree. But if you do have a smaller tree that's, that's uh, more susceptible, um, particularly if you have outbreaks of these a couple of years in a row, uh, they can cause some stunting to that plant. So um, generally speaking, if you can tolerate these, these guys, that's the best thing to do, let them go. Um, however, if you are having an issue, um, try spraying the underside of leaves with a kind of a, a powerful spray of water that can knock off some of those immatures. They can't get back up. And then if you need to, you can go to um, insecticidal soaps or horticultural oils, again, targeting the underside of the leaves where they prefer to, uh, uh, to feed, and that can be pretty successful for treating these. Awesome, good, and it's, isn't it early, maybe? Yeah, it's... Lace bugs, great. <laughs> Dennis. Yes. <laughs> it appears to be a zombie fox. It's a steady skin red fox. I've been getting a lot of um, emails and uh, inquiries about red fox. Yes, they're around and the young ones are around. Um, and there's plenty in Lincoln. We had a grad student do work on them. Their main food is rabbits, uh, those small little rabbits. Um, so they're helpful that way. Um, and most of the studies we've been, uh, the studies with their blood, they're not sh indicating a lot of disease transmission. So there's not much to worry about there. But one thing we did find out is that any fleas and ticks, and this was done in Kansas, not in Lincoln, that these animals have are dog ticks and cat fleas. And this is a thing that I think people need to know is that wild animals are not giving our pets fleas and ticks. Our, all the fleas and ticks that we have pretty much in most of our areas are cat fleas, tropical cat fleas are brought here by us from Europe. And we're giving, our pets are giving these wild animals fleas and ticks. It's not the opposite way. So don't think your pets are getting fleas and ticks from wild animals. Your pets are getting, giving fleas and ticks to the wild animals. So treat your pets <laughs> and, and help these poor animals. <laughs> Can't help that one. I think it's a little late. Yeah, it's been dead for 30 years. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dennis. All right, Sarah, what did we bring tonight? Well, in years past, I've brought some samples about this time of year to show what the pollen structures look like on pine trees and various other trees because people aren't used to seeing them and, and uh, we get questions sometimes. So I got a new question um, this week about these brown structures on this juniper. And these are, again, these are the little male pollen structures. So if you see here the little brown um, uh, kind of oval-shaped structures that you see at the tips of the branches, this is the male pollen source. And um, 
Junipers are dioecious, which means there are males and female trees, and this happens to be a male tree. So then let me switch over and show you a sample from a female tree, okay? These are even smaller, but these little tiny, they're, they're turning kind of brownish now because I think they've already been pollinated. These little tiny um, structures at the tips of the branchlets are <coughs> the female flowers. And you can tell a little easier that this is a female tree because you can see uh, it's got the blueberries on it. And this is the, the actual fruit or seed of the juniper, okay? So I guess my overall uh, point here is don't look at these brown structures on your junipers and think that these are bagworms or that there's some other kind of insect that you need to spray. This is a normal a part of the juniper plant itself. All right, thank you, Sarah. Kyle, your very first uh, question, you've got a couple of ones that are ID, which is a little tiny, as I recall, that little dude right there, and they sent in a little handful of pictures for us to look at, including one where she's got it on her watch so you can see what the scale is. So what is that, and is there something we should be doing about it? Uh, that looks like it's, it's a velvet mite, and um, no, there isn't anything you should be doing about it. These, um, these, these are the good guys of the mite world, so they're, um, you know, they're, they're pretty large. The immatures, they, uh, the larvae, they are parasites of other insects and spiders. Uh, the adults are, are predators of uh, insects, particularly insect eggs, and so chances are it's, it's probably feeding on something that you don't want in your garden, so you, you want to leave that. Okay, so it's not a velvet ant, though. It's a velvet Sorry. mite. Excuse you said me, mite. Velvet mite. Okay. You said mite. Yep, I said ant. Okay. All right, so you have another one, which is, uh, this is a papillion viewer. He found these tiny, tiny bugs on the white surfaces in his workshop, on the outside of his workshop door, smaller than half a millimeter. Can we identify these, and what are we going to do about these? Yeah, this, this again, is another mite. Um, this is either... Um, uh, either a, a cement or concrete mite, or um, possibly, I'm, I'm blanking on the other one, um, but either way, these are, are not, not harmful. They, you know, um, they basically are just coming inside with the change of season. Uh, they don't feed on, on people. The concrete mite, they are actually predatory. Some feed on pollen, and that's why they're attracted in the spring indoors, as there's, there's pollen kind of in the air. Um, in the other, excuse me, on the other hand, the other mite that I'm, I'm blanking on, um, they are, are plant feeders. They are especially associated with, with lawns, well-maintained lawns, uh, fertilized uh, lawns. And so if you, if you have that grass right up to the edge of the house, you, you commonly see those coming inside. So uh, what you would generally do for these is just vacuum them up to remove them. Um, you don't, you don't want to smash them or do anything like that. There's no treatment necessary. It'll go away in a few weeks. Um, and that's, that's all that's needed there. Okay, excellent. So they look a little like a tick, but they weren't, or a little like a spider. Yeah. And they but weren't. Related. Clover mites and concrete mites, they're different. There are Cor those the two different you're describing? Yes, and okay. so clover. clover mite was the one I was blanking on. Yep, it's clover mites and concrete mites. Clover mites are gonna feed on, on plants, um, but the, the concrete mites, they're, they're predatory or feeding on pollen. And they look very similar, but you can usually differ differentiate them by the length of those front legs. Clover mites have very long ones, um, but it can't quite see in that picture. Yeah. But clover mites probably more common. Interesting. I'd never heard of concrete mites before. That's, that's new. Yeah. And it's weird that they named a living thing after yeah. pavement. Yeah. Well, <laughs> probably where it was first found. Or they they show up on the pavement with the pollen. It's, oh, it's sure. kind of there you so. Go. So I think that's where the name came from. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, Dennis, yeah. um, this is sort of lots of different holes of things. And this first one is, um, this is a ravine behind the house. This is North Omaha near the Mormon Bridge. He uh, found this giant hole three feet high, six to eight feet on the downward side. He's wondering what that might, what might have made that hole. That's your first yeah. one. I don't see a lot of dirt around it. I'm thinking it could be a fox. It also could be a, well, a coyote would have more dirt around, but a fox sometimes doesn't use much dirt. Um, so I'm going with a, a fox, and it probably is bigger than it needs to be, but it'll get smaller as you get in. So I'm going with a fox, possibly a coyote. 
All right, cool. And then you've got uh, another series that is kind of a one, two, three of, first is tunnels in the lawn leading up to this bed. The second is the hole, and then there's this soil all mounded up and not much growing on it. So she's wondering what all this is, or is it the same thing, or different animals, or what is this? It looks primarily like it, it could be a combination of moles, just because of the way the ground is upheaved, but also with the hole open, it, it could be voles. And both of them, they're sympatric, which means they can be together. Um, but with all that dirt pushed up, I'm thinking, leaning more towards the moles, and um, it, it could easily be a mole. So if it is a mole. A mole, there's several ways. There's traps, of course, we have our wildlife.unl.edu, and you can use some uh, methods which are a toxicant. Uh, they look like gummy worms. They work very well. Or you can use just traps for moles. All right, and they do do a lot of damage. How fast can they paddle? 80, 80 feet in a night. <laughs> Yeah, lots of lots of. That's a damage. lot, and and you usually have one or two per acre. Wow. And it seems like you have a lot, but it's usually one or two per acre. All right, excellent. All right, Sarah, it's kind of pruning season, or at least should they prune season? Okay. Uh, your first one here is uh, Springfield viewer. They planted this Japanese maple in the fall. It was stressed before they planted it. They hoped it would come out of it. It is leafing out a little. Should they prune anything or leave it alone? Well, you could check some of those bare branches and see if they're dried out. And if they're dried out, then go ahead and prune them out because they, they would be dead at that point. Um, just a cautionary note about Japanese maples. They, they don't do well in Nebraska. They're, they're pretty much always stressed growing in Nebraska. Um, so you're going to need to give this a lot of special care, including um, some winter protection to get it to survive. So um, this isn't going to be an easy one. Fall planting is kind of yeah. tricky on them mm -hmm. too, but thanks there. All right, your second one here is, um, this is a star magnolia. And she says this is about 25 years old. It's got suckers coming up from the base. This is a Lincoln viewer. So mm -hmm. wondering whether they should prune out those suckers. Um, well, usually, I mean, you, you can prune star magnolias in different ways. They can have multiple stems and be more like a shrub, or they can be pruned to have maybe just um, two or three trunks and be more like a small tree. So it, it, it really is kind of up to you to decide which way you want this to appear. It looks like that this has been trained as a multi-trunked tree in the past. So at this point, I guess I would probably cut those shoots out and just maintain that small tree appearance. All right, and your third one is actually a, a lilac showing a little bit of damage. The question is trim off the bad stuff, plant a new lilac, stick it in a different spot, replace the soil. We don't have a picture of the whole plant. Okay, so, so I can't quite tell if you have a whole shoot that's dead there or if it's just a few of the bud, uh, the bud clusters that have died. If it's the bud clusters, then just ignore it. There's no point in pruning those off. If you actually have a whole stem that's dead, then definitely prune the dead stems out. Right, and it could just be fr freeze damage. Yeah, it damage. could easily be yeah. freeze damage, especially if it's just the buds that are damaged. Right. You know, if it's the whole stem that's damaged, then there could be other causes too. All right, excellent, thanks, Sarah. And from the category of nature's wondrous pageantry, we're going to show you a strange little structure you may have seen from time to time while you're out gardening. Praying mantis egg cases might seem alien, but what they hold might help you keep those pests away. Here to tell us more is Kyle. As you're out in your gardens this spring and the temperatures are starting to warm up, you're probably going to find a lot of interesting things. One of those things that you might find is the, the egg case of a variety of insects, including mantids, which I'd like to talk about today. The Oothika is the, the egg stage of, of mantids. So we have two common species here in eastern Nebraska, the, the Chinese mantis and the Carolina mantis. The Carolina mantis is a, is a native species uh, to the U.S., while the Chinese mantis is introduced from, from Asia. Uh, this species was originally found in the 1890s in, in Pennsylvania, um, but it's now quite widespread throughout the U.S. because of its uh, availability uh, as a pest control agent. The Chinese mantis is uh, about four and a half inches long as an adult. Um, they range in color from, from a solid green to mostly brown with sort of some green stripes on the side, 
Well, the Carolina mantis is only about two to two and a half inches uh, at, at their full length as an adult. In addition, the Carolina mantis has significant difference between the male and female. The males have a long slender body, whereas the females have a very robust abdomen and the wings don't completely cover the abdomen, making them essentially uh, flightless. Generally speaking, we think of mantids as being beneficial in the garden. Uh, these are predatory insects which will f feed on a variety of different insect pests. However, they are non-discriminate predators and they'll also feed on, on some beneficial insects that you might find in your garden too. Uh, although they're generally considered beneficial, uh, it's not really well established how, how much control they provide in the garden because of the fact that there's generally low survival of those early uh, stages of these insects and because of the fact that they also will consume beneficial insects like bees and wasps which might be pollinating your flowers. However, if you see an egg case in your garden, whether it's attached to a stem or you might even find them attached to your, uh, your house, uh, leave those egg cases there because it's really not hurting anything and in fact it might even have some benefit for your garden. We know from the questions that a lot of you have seen these before, leave them alone. And if our good friend, friend Baxendale was here, he would repeat that it's all a part of nature's wondrous pageantry. Uh, we've seen them on bricks, we've seen them on the window of our building two and a half stories up. <laughs> How in the world did they climb the glass? Mm -hmm. All right, Kyle, uh, you have, these people have ants not in their pants, but in their lawns, and probably if they sit in the lawn, they've got trouble. Um, he sent about three different pictures, I think, this first one, which is, could they be doing this much damage to the yard? Um, and he does live in Sherman County, so he's tearing it up this spring. He's wondering, will it kill them? There's, he, and he did have, a, uh, he didn't use a ruler because of course the ants won't hold still, but there is a little tiny, maybe three millimeter and they're bright red. So are, can they do that much damage? I, I don't think this is, this is from ants. I suspect that there's something else going on um, in that lawn. It's hard to say if it's environmental. Some other factors, I don't think the ants are responsible for all of that, that damage. In the, the one image, it looked like it was maybe cornfield ants, um, which are very common in, in lawns. Um, they are feeding predominantly on, on um, honeydew from aphids. Some have a mutualistic relationship with root feeding aphids. Um, but so they're, you know, they're not feeding on the roots. They're not causing any sort of injury, generally speaking. So I would say, you know, it's probably not worth your money to treat it. As far as, you know, tearing up that, that area, um, it should get the ants to move, but probably isn't going to kill them. So when you do see those big piles with all the bigger ants and all the holes and they're about like this in a lawn, is that just kick it over or spray it with water or? Um, if, if you have a larger one, um, like, um, like the field ants, those those are a little different. Yeah, they'll make the, the large mounds. Mm -hmm. um, kicking it over, they'll probably have it put back together tomorrow. So <laughs> that's probably not going to do anything. That that you might want to treat. Um, again, probably not going to kill the lawn extensively, but but can really be unsightly. Um, treatment can be really hard for them though, because you have to get it all the way to the queen to to kill the colony. All right. So just. Wondrous pageantry. Mm -hmm. There yep. we go. All right, and you have another one, I think, that is also ants. Um, this is ants in the kitchen, and uh, he he's tried a whole bunch of things, include different baits, scrubbing the countertops. Um, this it's a little hard to see that that what that one is, but there's a dime in there. So what are we going to suggest on this one? Yeah, unfortunately, can't identify it from from that picture. Um, <laughs> commonly, you see pavement ants, um, odorous house ants in, in kitchens. Um, a little bit suspicious with, with scrubbing everything the, in the kitchen, that, that might be counteractive or counterproductive to, to the baiting uh, strategy. So, you know, I would suggest not doing that, uh, vacuum them up um, because, you, you know, you want to have those trails that they're able to follow to that bait. And if you're just wiping that away, uh, that could be why those baits aren't, aren't being effective. Um, also, if you can collect any of those, you know, put them in a baggie, throw them in the freezer, and then see after they're, you know, after they're dead, if you can get some, some additional images, um, and particularly side profile, something that we can see the, the nodes, some identifiable characteristics. Um, that might also help us better determine if, if maybe a different baiting strategy is needed. 
All right, and they do love to follow that little trail, don't they? They, they do. Absolutely. All right, Dennis, you're going to be so happy about this next set of pictures. You said that about the last one. <laughs> well, you're really going to be happy oh, about yeah. this one. <laughs> so we have several that are just yeah, people have. Diadophus punctatus. That's the <laughs> decay's uh, brown snake that's full grown at 12 inches. It eats slugs and has a small head and eats uh, land snails. All right. It's its head right in there. It's a beneficial one. And that is um, the other one. That's the ringneck snake. And? So you had decays. Mm. And this one eats baby spiders and eggs. All right. And then we have another, I do believe, coming right up, maybe. Yep. Okay. That one is a um, rat snake. And I uh, can't, I'm trying to see get enough of the, the detail. I can't see the head real well. I'm going to go with a uh, Northern Plains rat snake. Either way, whether it's a Northern Plains rat snake or a Western rat snake, they're rodent feeders. And they're 100%, no germs or viruses, no teeth power. And they, this one feeds on rodents. And you have another one. <laughs> and this oh, was yeah. earlier in the season. This yeah, this <laughs> is... Um, these are garter snakes, and what's happening here is you have a mating aggregation. When the female comes out of hibernation, or brumnation for reptilians, it's brumnation, not hibernation, she lets out a pheromone or an odor. That'll attract every male, mature or not, within 100 yards. And they will just bunch up, and she will become mated. Uh, usually by, when she f feels she's sufficiently made it, she lets out a different odor that says, guys, go away. <laughs> and then she goes into gestation, and <clears throat> 70 to 80 days later, she'll have live birth. The nice part about this is they only meet once a year. And research done, both at my lab and other labs, have shown from DNA that the female usually gives birth to 2.3 uh, different uh, males have made it with her. So she's actually mixing mm. her genes in one litter that she has per year per me. Look at me. I had to get married and divorced twice to mix my genes properly. <laughs> These snakes have it made. Uh-huh. You had, yeah, it's Dennis. And that was McCook, by the way. And I think you have yet one more. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a milk yeah. snake. But I don't think he killed it. I think this is one that they... Got run over? Yeah, they found. Okay, we'll hope so. Yeah. Um, it is a, it's a milk snake because it eats baby mice and it also eats small lizards. Um, but the reason it's called a milk snake is the saying is that people found them in milking barns and there's bales of straw because they eat those pinky mice. And they thought they were after the milk or the cow's udder, but they were after the pinky mice. They're lactose intolerant. Um, <laughs> so they weren't after the milk and they're just 100% harm, harmless and beneficial. Okay, so don't kill those snakes. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, you know, I tried my best not to give you bad trees, but That's you okay. know, we have a lot of bad trees. <laughs> so this is a red oak. Uh, this is Alma, Nebraska. It's about three years old. They just noticed this hole. They, they thought it looked like a bore hole, but that's a pretty darn big hole. And they're wondering what would have caused it and what could they do about it at this point? Yeah, that doesn't look like a borehole to me. It's, it's too large for that. Um, so my first thought is that possibly this is an old pruning site when this tree was really, really young. There was a, a, um, a shoot, a secondary shoot that came out that was pruned away that some wood rot has, has gotten in there and is, has rotted out this section of the trunk. So the bad, the bad part about this is that rot is going to go through up all the way up the tree through the wood that was present at the time when that damage, whatever the damage was, happened. So you're going to have a core, a central core in there of wood rot. But that's, you know, the tree, if it can repair this or seal over it, you can have new successive rings of wood that will be um, not infected by the wood rot. So on the flip side, this is a pretty young tree. So... Okay significant injury, you know, you might think about taking it out and just starting over. Right. And then you have a, a red maple, I think, is your next one, Sarah, which yeah. is showing this. This is really, really very extremely common in maples. And it's um, death of the bark. 
Most likely this is um, a winter injury that happened uh, when the, the, if this is on the south or the west side of the tree, when the bark got warm on a warm day in the winter and then night temperatures fall very quickly and then it can kill the bark that, that was really warm during the day. So um, it looks like the tree is trying to put out some new callus tissue that is eventually going to be able to come and seal over this damage. That would be the best outcome if the tree was able to seal over this damaged area. But once again, there will be wood rot that will enter into the trunk and that will affect all of that wood that was present at the time that the bark died. And that needs some mulch. Yeah, right. We don't like to see grass growing right up to the trunks of the trees. That's one simple thing you can do to improve tree vigor is just to mulch around the base. And the bigger, the wider of a ring of mulch you're willing to go, the better. Right. And then this one is, uh, they say the redbud looks really healthy and then, but, but it's exfoliating, so is this normal? You know, I looked at this picture and, and my first thought was, I wondered if this was some kind of bird injury due to some type of an insect larva. Are there any boars or any, any insects that would be inside or underneath that bark that would be attractive to woodpeckers or something along that line? There, there are um, native longhorn beetles that will bore into, into red buds because it looks more than just exfoliation. It almost looks like something is stripping the bark away. So, I mean, there could be birds. Mm -hmm. Squirrels wouldn't do anything like no, that, would it, they? It, you'd be able to see the birds would actually strip big pieces. Okay. Right. But if there's any kind of bores, even small, small bores, birds will we'll hear them, even though it. we can't, and they will peck for them. Yeah. And they may not be right on target, so you get a lot of pecking and debarkation mm -hmm. from one bird trying to find that that little. Yeah. Well, and they do, they do peel or exfoliate a little bit yeah. as they this, age. This seemed more kind of than what yeah. you would normally expect in a red bud. So yeah. um, it didn't seem like a normal situation to me. I guess I was thinking again, bird activity of some kind. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, decent weather is actually finally trending and we're hoping to get our garden planted soon. So let's take a few minutes to head out to the backyard farmer garden and hear from Terry James. week in the backyard farmer garden we're just about ready for that transition between the greenhouse growing and moving everything outside. It uh, looks like we're keeping an eye on the weather but it looks like we're gonna be able to start hardening those plants off here in the next coming week um, but as of right now everything's in there growing great and we are still doing some fine-tuning and working on the outside. As you can see in our herb bed, we have lots of plants that have come back every year. Uh, looks like we need to do a little bit of dividing, so we're gonna work on that. Looks like we have some that has moved out of the raised bed and into the pathway, so we're gonna remove that. We're gonna work on our edges, so we're just gonna work out in the backyard farmer garden and get everything ready for when we need to start planting here in the next couple weeks. So stop by the backyard farmer garden and see what's happening. Those perennial herbs have been in that raised bed ever since we installed it a few years ago, and they're really doing quite nicely, which tells you what herbs take. Um, so right now it is time for our lightning round. Sarah, you are first up. Are All you right. ready? I am ready. This is a question that came to us from Marshall County, Kansas. She said they planted kohlrabi last year. They got great foliage, but they didn't get any kohlrabis. Why? I'm wondering if they didn't thin, if they didn't thin the seedlings so that the plants had good enough room to develop, that could be one reason why. All right. We have a viewer who said her tulips have put on just one or two floppy leaves and no flower buds. What's up with that? So the bulbs don't have enough vigor to bloom. So you need to uh, make sure they're in full sun, make sure you leave the leaves on until they die naturally. And um, it, sometimes that happens in heavy soils. Bulbs are not real happy in very heavy clay. All right, we have another one who said her tulips bloom beautifully for two years and nothing. Same thing. Okay. Yep. <laughs> when should you prune back the feather reed grasses? Take the top off Carl Forster and those feather reed grasses. Um, I did mine back in March. Um, I usually try to do it before they start to grow too much and they, they start to grow surprisingly early. So you could do it in the fall or you could do it very early in the spring. All right, this is a Sioux City viewer who wants to use three quarts of softener salt and 12 ounces of dish soap in water to kill weeds. Is that effective? No, no. You, the salt, you know, 
plants, too much salt in the soil is toxic to plants. So you may kill the weeds, but you may kill the grass around it and have trouble getting anything to grow there again. So I would not do that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have a viewer wondering what is the name of the spiky stuff that you recommend that you can put on the house to keep birds away? Nexolite. Nexolite. Or porcupine wire. All right. What is the best scare tactic uh, to keep swallows from underneath boat canopies? And this is a Johnson Lake viewer. Yeah. You can use the Nexolite or bird netting to keep them out. No chemical. Okay. Squirrels are chewing on, uh, there's wooden barn quilt signs, you know, on barns mm -hmm. here, and the squirrels are chewing on the bottoms of them. What will stop that? Okay, that's squirrel graffiti, telling the other squirrels this is my territory. Use uh, hot pepper and vegetable oil and paint it two feet on each side and repeat, repeat after each rain. After each rain, all right. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who is worried, worried about, uh, she's hearing urban foxes that are screaming at night. Should she worry? No, enjoy it. That's their voice. Okay. You know. We have a viewer who tried uh, your marshmallow in a live, uh, live trap, but sh they keep taking the bait, but not <laughs> getting caught. <laughs> you need to hang it with a piece of wire, try that, and put burlap over it. So they have to go in to get to the marshmallow. They can't put their hands in from the side. So put burlap over the marshmallow. No, over, over the, the whole cage. cage. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, over the cage. Excellent. Nice job. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. This is a Norfolk viewer, Kyle, who says the leaves of their columbine already have sw white squiggly lines in them. What is that and what to do about it? It sounds like some sort of a leaf miner. Uh, there's several different groups. I'm not familiar with, with what's uh, doing that in, in columbine specifically. I'm not sure about control. I have to look into that. All right, excellent. This is a Council Bluffs viewer who wonders, is there anything she can do organically to control squash bugs? Um, yeah, de destroying any sort of leaf litter that was left the previous year. Um, should really do that, clean that up in the winter so you're not leaving places for them to, to overwinter. Um, you can also use, I think, uh, diatomaceous earth um, is, is acceptable for, for that. Um, and then, you know, possibly looking into some resistant, resistant varieties of plants. Or... Okay. When do we uh, put out mason bee houses? Um, they should be out now already. Um, I would say probably you want to have those out, I, I would say at least in March. Excellent. Is it safe to use a soil drench with imidacloprid in it under lindens? No. Excellent. Nice job. You kind of have it down. Yeah. Yeah. That was job. not bad for the first starters. <laughs> All right, Sarah, what do we have for plants of the week? All right. Well, the, the little plant in the front here with these uh, pretty little cream colored flowers is American bladder nut. And that is a shrub. It's kind of a tall shrub. It can get up to about um, 10 to 15 feet, somewhere in that range. Um, it's a forest edge plant. It likes to be, you know, in the, sh in the shade of taller trees, but on that bright edge um, of a planting. So uh, that's where you'll find it. Um, it's a, a nice shrub. If you're looking for something taller, it will sucker. So you do need to make sure that you're willing to, you know, to have a plant there that will sucker but it's a nice kind of unusual plant that we don't see people using in landscapes very often. Then the taller flower here is woodland phlox. And um, woodland phlox is a perennial and um, it's a, a shorter phlox. Usually it's, it's around a foot or so, maybe, maybe a little bit taller than that. Um, and it will spread also, it's kind of, kind of a colony former, so it will slowly spread through an area. It likes to be in um, shaded, partial shade areas underneath trees. And it does have a really nice scent to it. I, I was just sniffing them, Kim, and they smell a little bit like violets to me. Mm -hmm. but they have a nice scent. Mm -hmm. yep. And those are both native, which is yeah. excellent for people who love the natives. Yeah, so thank you, Sarah. All right, Kyle, uh, we have some fun identification things for you now. So your first one here is, she saw this in Nemaha County. She wonders, uh, what is it? What's that one to begin with? So this is a this is a butterfly. It's a zebra swallowtail, um, and this is our our only um, regular representative uh, of the quite a kite swallowtails. Excuse me. Um, so there's two different forms. There's the the spring form, which is what we're seeing here, uh, which are, are lighter and they have kind of that shorter tail on the the back of the wing, 
And then in the summer, they, they're darker and have a much lo longer tail. Uh, really, I think, one of our, our most attractive uh, butterflies, especially the, the summer form with the real long tails. Excellent. And then we have your second one here is, uh, this is north of Fairbury, and they were getting things out of the garden shed and noticed they're calling them milkweed-sized pods on the back of, the, of a garden gnome, and they weren't there, uh, tried to open it by hand. They had to cut it open, and they wonder what that was or would have been. Yeah, it, it looks like um, there's still the pupa up at the top there. So these are the cocoons for, uh, looks like Cercopia moth. And uh, these are, are probably certainly among the showiest, most impressive, uh, beautiful moths that we have in, in North America. Uh, really large. Uh, they're Saturniids or silkworm moths. Um, they have, um, you know, weeks, wingspan up to six inches. Um, very, very beautiful moths. And so this is the cocoon. And then inside there, you can kind of see that brownish um, pupa, that's, that's what's in, inside that cocoon. So they overwinter in that stage and then the adults will be emerging pretty soon. So the one that got cut up with scissors is not coming? I, I don't know if that one will make it or not. But, right. uh, but send pictures once, once those adults do come. All right, and I think you have one more uh, to identify, which is, uh, what is that guy? I, I think this is a, a banded or, uh, yeah, banded woolly bear caterpillar. Um, usually they have um, sort of a more prominent kind of rusty brown band in the center. It looks like it's pretty faint in this image, uh, but I think that's what, what this one is. Um, and I've seen these out in, in big numbers right now. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the adult, it turns into um, uh, a tiger moth, Isabella's tiger moth for that particular species, which are uh, fairly pretty moth. They're, they're kind of a, a whitish to yellowish color with either uh, pink or orange, depending on the sex. Nice, thank you very much. All right, Dennis, uh, this is a viewer, a Lincoln viewer, who saw this obvious tree damage, uh, several ponds and a creek close mm -hmm. by. He's wondering, is this muskrats or beavers or what? It's beaver. Okay. Yep. And anything to keep the you beavers could, from yeah, doing that? If you, if you have certain trees you don't want them to take, <laughs> usually they take the trees you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, they helped the university by taking all the elms, so our landscape services didn't have to take them down. So they saved the university several thousand dollars, the beavers. <laughs> Can't get Ronnie Green to pay them, but that's another thing. Um, but you could use uh, drain tile. You cut it, slit it, get it warm, and put it around it. And even though they probably could, and that drain tile comes three foot in diameter all the way down to two inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And you want it an inch to two inches wider than the tree, so you don't girdle the tree. And you just put it around the tree up to four foot up, and they won't touch those trees. Excellent. All right, and then you have uh, some other critter damage ones. This is, um, she thinks this is squirrels. This is Omaha. Well, and, she thinks right. Okay. And then, so then, of course, she's wondering. That's also squirrels. You can see the incisor marks. And again, it's, it, that's not a food product. Mm -hmm. So it's squirrel graffiti. What happens, the male squirrel will do a chip every morning and rub his chin there where there's pheromones, and that's telling the other squirrels, you know, this is my area, my turf, you know, my crib, you guys back off. And, and to get that, to stop them to do that, because it's not a food value, you could use the cayenne pepper and vegetable oil, and people always ask, how much cayenne pepper? You try it, and you, you have to run and drink some milk, you got it hot enough. All right, <laughs> The thanks. best way to do it. <laughs> All right, Sarah, uh, this is a North Platte viewer that has an ash. Uh, uh, she said it was an ash, but we don't think this is an ash. We think it's a, we're not, sh we think it's either a crab apple or a hawthorn or something, but her question really is the suckers at the base and with how to manage this and, yeah. and uh, what to do about this. There's, unfortunately, there's really no magic bullet to this. You just need to keep cutting them back. Yeah. There's nothing that's very effective at preventing these from regrowing, and so they will regrow, and you'll just have to keep cutting them back. All right, and then your next one is a gearing viewer who has a cottonless cottonwood. They didn't send us the full tree, but having seen this in gearing, um, lots and lots of issues associated with this. He's wondering whether it's worth saving. You know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what is causing the damage, if this is disease or if it's some kind of physical injury, if there's been some hail and these have been, <coughs> the, the hail damage has been infected with cankers or something like that. Um, but. It, it doesn't look like it's a really 
great tree, so it might be better to just go ahead and take it out. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, part of the fun of gardening is trying all that new plant material. And of course, it's fine to keep some of those old standards that have proven themselves year in and year out, but trying new plants, new colors, and new textures can make any season exciting. So we went to York to talk to Todd Fowler from Fowler Landscapes to see what he is gonna recommend. A few of the new annuals and perennials we're carrying this year at the greenhouse, and a few of them have been around for a year or two but are just unusual yet, um, I'd like to show you. One of them is Artemisia silver. It's uh, in the silver mound family but just gets larger, more in the two by two range. Great for an accent, just like a lot of white plants are. Uh, another white one that's new this year is Senecio angel wings. Um, oddly enough, this is related to succulent senecios, but look at the fuzzy white silver leaves on that. Another great accent to show other colors off. Speaking of whites, we've got diamond snow, which is an improvement over diamond frost. More compact, more floriferous as the summer goes. Uh, hopefully a little less brittle sometimes in production. We might have some of them snap a little easier. And a perennial that's bright white is Snow Station Iberis, or Candy Tuff. Very bright white, true colors there. Uh, we've also got some dahlias. That, the last year was year of the dahlia, and we still carried that over this year. Um, Labella Magior Rose Bicolor. We use that as a compact upright one for planters. Uh, salvias are also very popular. This one is called Rock and Fuchsia. Very bright, gets about two by two. And then a few other salvia that we just want to show here. Um, Marvel series salvia is, is a nice new series with larger blooms, and you can see these here. This one happens to be Rose Marvel, and this one is Sky Blue Marvel. But beautiful cottage look, uh, very hardy, and uh, can do very well in the landscape. And then great plants for Summer heat and bright areas, pop star biddens, bright yellow, larger bloom than normal, kind of airy foliage. Petunias and pachoas, which is a cross between petunia and calabricoas, one called cinnamon, and a, a, a super bells variety called over easy. Looks like a little bit of an egg color there, that's where it gets his name. A few of the other items that I'd like to highlight at the garden center this year are some woodies that we carry. Um, I'm always a, a lover of pine and, and different evergreens, and a couple of them are, are Japanese white pine. Fukuzumi is one of them. It's more of a spreader that uh, gets upright, so you're probably looking at about 15 wide by 6 tall in almost a chair shape, but very, very unusual around decks and patios. My Ajima is more of an upright, but a slow grower that gets about 15 by eight foot. And Troutman is a newer juniper that rivals the Taylor juniper, only a little more natural, gets about 15 to 20 by about four or five foot wide. And then a few of the Japanese maple, Korean maple crosses that hold a lot of promise in areas that maybe struggled with Japanese maple a little bit are uh, three new interject introductions from the Jack Frost series, North Winds, Ice Dragon, and, and uh, Arctic Jade. Uh, those three are uh, from a nursery in Oregon, and the cross has proven to take 30-some below zero winters. Um, they, one of them is a weeper, one has a little bit more of a palmate leaf, and the other one is a little more dissected. But uh, beautiful fall colors, kind of bronze color in the spring as well. So uh, nice trees that get in that 15 to 20 foot range. So these are some of the items that we're carrying at the garden center this year. Feel free to stop in and we'll help you where we can. And thanks to Todd at Fowler Landscapes in York for sharing his expertise and all that beauty with us. We will of course hear from him next week also when he returns to help us with gardening gifts for Mother's Day. <laughs> All right, so we have a handful of pictures. We'll kind of fling through these. 
Kyle, your next one is uh, this nest that appeared. She, we thought maybe it was a bird, and then she said, whoops, here comes some holes in it. What is this, and should she take it down? This is in Lincoln. Yeah, I think it's it's probably a mud dauber nest. Um, the holes that that are showing up, those would be, you know, this was was a, a nest that was made last year or, or previously. Um, she left eggs, larvae inside there, and then they're they're emerging this year. So that's why you're you're getting those holes now. Um, it's safe to take it down. You can scrape it off. There, you know, there's not going to be any adults guarding it. Actually, mud daubers don't don't really do that anyways. So there's there's not going to be any harm in in doing that. Excellent. Then you have one, uh, the title of this subject was Humming Trees. Uh, she's got nine of these. Uh, this year they started humming like swarms of bees. Uh, they're worse on the west. And then they saw some of these insects coming out, looked like this. So what is this? And this is Oxford, Nebraska. I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on here, actually, um, especially if it's, it's all the trees. Um, this particular uh, insect here, this is a fly. It looks like, uh, I, I think maybe it's it's a golden dung fly. Uh, the the immatures, they're they're developing in dung. Um, you know, the adults will feed on other flies, maybe some other insects. I think um, there was mention of other other flies, blue flies. Those sound like um, blowflies, which again are, are decomposers. So I don't know if maybe there's something that's died in there and and it's attracting all the flies or, or what's going on, but I, I don't, it doesn't sound like anything that's gonna hurt the tree, so I would say just let it run its course and it'll probably go away. And if it happens next year, we're gonna take our cameras out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Critter for you, this is a Nelson, uh, Nebraska viewer. Okay. They have a small pond in their uh, yard and during the winter, these mounds appeared and they, she thinks a lot of her plants are dead. It looks like it could be voles. Voles uh, work under the snow cover, and if you have any bulbs or anything that has a decent sized root, they're root feeders uh, during the winter. So it, Even on the edges of the pond, because that's yeah. pond stuff, yeah. It's hard to say. It doesn't look like crayfish. It doesn't look like anything that would be an aquatic. It's too dry and granular. Okay. I would, yeah, with just that picture, voles is the best I can say, unless it's like a, I don't think it's going to be a cicada wasp. No, but it, yeah. too, too early. Too early, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe she'll see it or it'll do yeah. some more. And then you've got this one, ah. this is Omaha, showed up in the pond. She wondered what kind of a, a, yeah, a thing it is. It, it, yeah. Well, it's a uh, plains leopard frog, now the northern leopard frog. You can tell by the white dot in the tampanum and the broken dorsolateral fold. So <laughs> it's uh, definitely a plains leopard frog. And a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All frogs are good guys. Oh. They eat nothing but flying insects. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, Sarah, you have a couple that are uh, the same plant. We're in a different location. Okay. The first is Hastings. Uh, what is going on with the arborvitae? So mm -hmm. showing that damage. And the second one is essentially a newly planted arborvitae that has some tannish and whitish foliage on it. Uh, they're in Bellevue. So. Okay. Well, this image looks like just winter desiccation, yeah. which is common on arborvitae. They, you know, they, since it's a broadleaf or since it's an evergreen, they um, lose water faster in the winter than they can replace it. And that can result in some of the, the leaves and the, ne the needles, if you will, um, drying out in, and dying, which is basically what we're seeing in this picture. Um, in the, the next picture, I think there were also some s small sections of twigs that had died. Mm -hmm. um, and that could just simply be physical damage if this was newly planted this spring. Um, yeah, yeah and, they're, little... and they, they're very small. So I wouldn't think that this is anything to be too concerned about. I would just prune these out and um, you know, provide the tree with good care and hopefully it'll grow out and fill in and, and be healthy for you. All right, thanks, Sarah. All right, we have a minute and we're gonna ask you one question. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we had we actually had a lot of questions about bagworms again. So where are we in bagworm treatment cycle? What do we use for bagworms, Kyle? Not quite there yet. Um, okay. Bagworms are going to start start coming out of those bags, the caterpillars, um, middle May. So maybe looking at a few weeks um, to to the beginning of June. Um, so that's when you really want to monitor for them. See see if you can um, you know find when they're coming out then. 
Um, a good time to treat is usually the beginning of June. You might want to treat a couple of times in June depending on what treatment you're using. Um, BT is, is a really good option. Um, again, getting that early. Um, if you miss that, you can use, um, you know, you're a little bit later, like getting into July. Um, you can use Carbaryl, also synthetic uh, pyrethroids. Um, you can do that up until the point that the caterpillars are about a half of an inch, um, but really the sooner the better. That's when they're, they're most susceptible is when they're, they're those really, really young caterpillars. Um, once they're within that bag, they're, they're pretty well protected and toast. Yep. All right. Thanks, Kyle.